And it is. We're looking at a review of our lesson on intermolecular forces, IMF, intermolecular forces. And through the lessons of uh, section one and section two from our video lessons, this is just an opportunity to check in with you and see how the definitions are actually coming to life. I really stress that the second section of our chapter really is the heart and soul of the new learning process. And that really is the focus of this review, trying to just check in and make sure we understand what the four, um, intermolecular forces are and how they are different and how indeed they are the same. So we have three intermolecular forces that are actually categorized as van der Waal forces. That might be a brand new word for us in terms of the note pack lesson. Van der Waal forces are very specific to molecules only. And if I just remind myself about a lesson on what's a molecule versus a formula unit, what's a covalent bond instead of an ionic bond, I mean, we've been some time talking about bonding. We know that compounds come in two categories. Compounds can either be ionic or they can be molecular. One of our intermolecular forces is very specific to ionic compounds and three of our intermolecular forces are very unique to those covalently bonded molecules. The molecular compounds, remember those are non-metals grouping together, sharing electrons. We spent the last several chapters drawing their structures, kind of hooking them together, talking about their geometry. What holds the molecules together? So if I have a, a, a set of molecules, either the same kind or of different categories, we, oh, bless you, we want to talk about what types of attractions there are between the molecules, intermolecular, between the molecules. There is another word, intramolecular attractions, just to kind of emphasize intra. Intramolecular would mean within the same molecule. But intermolecular, we know, would be between different molecules, intermolecular. What are those attractions that are um, keeping the molecules together? Well, the three categories of intermolecular forces that talk about molecules, and this is kind of the list in order of increasing strength. The weakest of all of those would be called the London dispersion force. London dispersion force, sometimes just referred to dispersion force. Well, London is actually not named after the city, but it's a person's name. But London dispersion force, or simply dispersion forces, those exist between all molecules. I don't care if they're polar or nonpolar. Every molecule will exist uh, and have a, a London dispersion force between them. But it is the weakest of the three intermolecular attractions. The next strongest would be a dipole-dipole attraction. And just to remind ourselves, when I hear the word dipole, that prefix di puts in my mind the number two, and the word pole means just opposite charges. It's a molecule that's polar. When I hear the word dipole, just it's a single molecule with areas that are positive and areas that are negative. Dipole molecules are polar. The strongest intermolecular attraction that exists between molecules is hydrogen bonding. And that's a very specific set of circumstances if we have hydrogen bonding going on. Hydrogen attached to an N, nitrogen, an O, oxygen, or a fluorine, those tiniest atoms that are the strongest electronegative atoms. Hydrogen bonding is, is a rare example of the, the strongest kind of intermolecular attraction, but there's a very specific set of circumstances that set up hydrogen bonding. I often call it just H bonding if that's a little short order. So these three are categorized as van der Waal forces because they exist between molecules, molecular compounds where you have nonmetals bonding together. The fourth type of intermolecular force unique to ionic compounds is simply called an ion dipole force. Here the word ion, well that's a charged atom, isn't it? Ions come in two flavors, two categories, cat ion or anion, positive ions or negative ions. So if I think about an ionic compound, such as table salt, NaCl, metal to nonmetal, I know it's built of positive ions and negative ions. A positive is a cat ion, a negative is an anion. How might that be attracted to something like a water molecule, the polar molecule, an ion, 
either positive or negative, attracted to a dipole, some sort of molecule that's a charged particle. So we're looking at types of charges that are attracting each other. And just a basic law of electricity says opposites attract, likes repel. How might molecules align themselves to create this opposite attraction, the strength between uh, opposite poles? And then if we have nonpolar molecules, how do they align themselves? It's really mixing around, minding their own business. So the strength, London dispersion, the weakest, a little bit stronger dipole-dipole, strongest of all, hydrogen bonding for the molecules. And if we have salts involved, kind of like a, a dissolving process, we take a solid salt, drop it into water, we'll have an ion-dipole attraction. Let's dig in in, in kind of a, a different order than I wrote them up here. We'll talk about dipole-dipole forces first. Draw a little example just to kind of help visualize how those um, molecular attractions are working. So if I took apart dipole-dipole, alrighty, Bailey, may I call on you for the first one? Just share with me an ex uh, a definition you might have written down for that term. So here's what I'm saying. Definite word is polarity due to their structure. So um, perhaps let's make it a little more friendly, if we will, because your, your definition is absolutely spot on. But a polar molecule attracted to a polar molecule, that's really what you're saying. That might be a little bit easier to jot. So I'm going to just say the force of attraction between polar molecules. Polar means opposites attract. So if I have two polar molecules, I have regions that are positive and regions that are negative. How might they align themselves to create these dipole-dipole attractions? So these are forces that exist because they have regions that are oppositely charged. Let's say, for example, um, I have a molecule. And maybe what I'll do instead of drawing an actual molecule, I'm just going to kind of draw an area of a molecule that has positive and an area that has negative. So I know that's not really drawing necessarily um, a true molecule. Could be something like uh, CHCl. I mean, that's just kind of giving a representation of what I'm trying to draw a little bit easier. This molecule is called um, methyl chloride, but it definitely has regions that are more negative than others. In other words, see these exposed electrons over on this side making that area more negative? In the previous chapter, I used one of those little symbols that said that's a partial negative charge. We could clearly see this being a polar molecule because it has a unique area of electrons. This little spot then would represent this area that would be left partially positive as the electron density gets pulled in one direction. So. This might be just an easier version instead of having to draw simple models like that. This is going to be my version of just making it easier to draw. We have a molecule that has an, e uh, an area that is positive and an area that is negative. We call this a dipole. A dipole is something that has two opposite charges within the same structure, just like a bar magnet is a dipole. It has a positive end and a negative end. A battery has a positive end and a negative end. If this particular molecule has a positive region and a negative region, it's called a dipole. How might a second molecule, identical, I mean just the same methyl chloride, how, how might it align itself to create this intermolecular attraction? Well, if this is the area that's negative, what would you suspect the next molecule is going to align itself over? Would I place the hydrogens there to show the positive end, or would I align it with the chlorine, the negative area, if the negative is exposed here? Yeah, positive, right? So opposites attract. If I were to draw in a second molecule, I'm going to show that the positive end, those hydrogens, are going to align themselves closer to this negative end, and this negative is going to be repelled over here, isn't it? So it's kind of pushing itself away. And if I keep drawing, I could see a positive aligning here. I could see a positive going here. I'm just kind of twisting the molecules to make sure that I have opposite charges close to each other and like charges 
far away. Then what we tend to see are these little dashed lines to show not a true bond. It's not a true bond. Bonds come in just categories called ionic, covalent, or metallic. These aren't ionic bonds. These aren't molecular bonds. These are covalent bonds. They aren't metallic bonds. They're just attractions. So they, they're not as strong as true bonding, but they are indeed strong enough to cause, uh, you know, certain characteristics like viscosity, surface tension, and so forth that in lessons that are coming up. So I'll just go ahead and finish drawing in what I call those dipole dipole attractions and those are the attractions that exist between two molecules that are polar it's as easy as that so if I were to label what my little dashed lines are it's simply a dipole dipole and I'll just say IMF for intermolecular forces intermolecular attractions IMF is typically what you'll see so the first of our examples a polar molecule aligning itself to another polar molecule, just arranging them so that the opposite charges come close together. This molecule would represent something that is polar, and I'm just kind of making that symbol a little bit easier to draw for us. Alrighty. Let's talk about well, I, what I call the weakest intermolecular attraction, called the London dispersion force, or just simply dispersion force. Alrighty. Noah, would you like to share what you wrote for a definition there? Excellent. A temporary dipole. Something that is induced and then immediately leaves. It's very temporary. So every, every, every molecule has the ability to attract electrons as it comes near it and then it will set it aside. So again, I'm going to try to just capture what you had there and I just wrote results from attractions between temporary and that's a really important clue for, for example, oh, I just spelled it wrong, between temporary, like if I'm working a multiple choice or like a homework question, if I see anything about temporary or uh, non-permanent, whatever adjective or synonym you might want to put there, temporary redu uh, reduction of poles, I always pick the dispersion force. So induced poles. A very temporary attraction between induced poles, however you want to put that into your own words. And now in my head when I see this, every molecule has it, but it is the only intermolecular attraction between nonpolar, bless you, and nonpolar. Let me say that again. Every molecule exhibits van der Waal forces for London uh, dispersion. Everyone. I don't care if it's polar or nonpolar. But it is the only type of attraction if it's a nonpolar molecule. So let's suppose, and I'm just going to pick, let me draw a little helium, I guess. That's a simple atom. Inside the nucleus of a helium are two positive protons. There's neutrons as well, but they're not charged. I'll just not even bother drawing them. And then outside, I know that there's two electrons. And maybe I'll even draw those little dots to represent electrons. I'll label this as a helium atom, just so you can get an idea of what I'm trying to draw. I'm not the world's best artist. So a couple of protons in the nucleus. It's a small atom, a couple of electrons around. What might happen if this particular helium atom comes in close contact with another helium atom? So if I just try to draw another helium atom, knowing that it's positive, it's got some negatives, if the electron density is rich to this side, that's going to repel the electrons over here and pull the positive protons closer. So that's exactly what an induced pole is. And boy, when you said temporary, I mean, it's instantaneous and then they're gone. So it's a very temporary induced pole. If the electrons are rich on one side, now you, let me explain what that means. Electrons move, right? They're not in a fixed position. And we have a better understanding now that electrons don't orbit, but they're actually in kind of a three-dimensional space, aren't they? They're creating this cloud-like ex uh, experience. 
we also know that they are found uh, at any particular instant. They could be found anywhere within that particular um, S-shaped orbital for the helium. Let's suppose, as these guys are zipping around creating their S-shaped orbital, that both of them, just for an instant, land to the same side of our atom, giving this area an electron-rich density, pulls these protons of a close-by atom close by repelling the electrons of that atom and putting them on the other side. I'm just trying to, to represent what induced pull means. It doesn't stay that way very long because these electrons don't like each other. They're going to separate and then induced pull is gone. A dispersion force is a temporary pull because somehow, some way, electrons ended up too close together in an atom and pulled the protons of a nearby guy near uh, and, and created this temporary but nonetheless, intermolecular attraction. It is induced. It is temporary. Maybe I'll even say it is very temporary. It's the weakest intermolecular attraction. It just happens by one particular moment in time. Electrons get rich on one side of an atom and pull the protons near nearby. Alrighty. It's a very weak intermolecular attraction. All molecules, all molecules can do this, but it is the only intermolecular attraction for nonpolars. Alrighty. If London dispersion are the strongest, or excuse me, the weakest, here comes the strongest. These are called hydrogen bonds or H bonds. Alrighty. Andrew, what did you write for a definition for hydrogen bonding? Excellent. Extreme, I'm going to just capture not necessarily every word, but some important little phrases I heard. Extremely strong. Hydrogen attracted to, and here's what you said, an extremely small electronegative element. Well, who's the smallest, strongest electronegative element? Top right, we're going to say, oh, that's fluorine. Next door is oxygen. Next door is nitrogen. Those are the three smallest electronegative elements. So hydrogen, who is typically positive as a charge, is going to be attracted to these very small, very strong electronegative elements. So these are the conditions. H has to be attracted to an F an O or an N. That's it. Those are the three elements that meet the criteria of a small, strong electronegative element. They're a very strong attraction. H has to be connected to an F, an O, or an N. That's it. That's a hydrogen bond. See how specific the criteria is? And yet it is by far the strongest intermolecular attraction. It what may, it's what makes water a liquid at room temperature, even though it has a very low molar mass. It's such a unique molecule for that reason. So let's suppose hydrogen hooked to fluorine. That's probably the simplest one to draw. The molecule hyd hydrogen fluoride, if it's in a gaseous phase, hydrogen fluoride, HF. H is attached to an F. A second molecule comes by. H is attracted to an F. Second molecule comes by. Maybe I'll draw these like this so you can see these are little molecules. And where is the intermolecular attraction? Where is the actual H bond? It's not this molecular bond. It's not the, the electron sharing within the orbital. Remember, it's the attraction between. So that's worth kind of drawing. Remember, this is a covalent bond in a molecule. That's an actual bond where electrons are being shared by specific atoms. The attraction called hydrogen bond is between the molecules. The hydrogen bond is between the molecules. And boy, oh boy, that is so darn strong, it keeps those molecules clustered together more so than any other of those van der Waal forces. We can consider 
let me just try to draw a second example, maybe with an O and an H. Maybe you have a, a neater paper, a side margin. If we were to draw a water molecule, just as another example, we know water is a bent molecule. It has like a, a what, 422 molecular geometry, so it comes out bent. So we know that this area is extremely negative. These areas are extremely positive. Water is a polar molecule, but it also exhibits hydrogen bonding. That this area on water would be attracted to the opposite charged of a second molecule. I have O attached to an H, so it meets the criteria of hydrogen bonding. But remember, these within a molecule, that's covalent bonding. That's, that's an actual bond. That's strong. The attraction is between the molecules. That's the definition here of the hydrogen bond. The attraction between the molecules. But we have to meet the criteria in the molecule. H has to be connected to an N. Here's an example we've drawn a million times called ammonia. That would have hydrogen bonding. H attracted to an F or H attracted to an O. Then the molecules align themselves based on that criteria to show a very strong intermolecular attraction called hydrogen bonding. So collectively, three, four, and five, those three exist between molecules. They exist between um, only molecular compounds known as van der Waal forces. When we talk about number six, kind of change in categories, looking at ionic compounds we commonly call salts, dissolving into some polar solvent, ion dipole forces. Alrighty. Brooke, would you like to share what is an ion dipole force? Thank you. I'm going to capture most of what I heard, but it went fast. So ions are attracted to polar molecules. Yours was much more thorough, but I captured the essence. Ions are charged atoms. They come as positive or negative. Polar molecules are called dipoles. We can see opposite charges attracting. Salts dissolving into water is an ion dipole attraction. Let's just show a little bit of a picture, best I can draw. A cation, which is positive, dissolving into a dipole, which is just a polar molecule. So I have a positive cation being surrounded by a polar molecule. And maybe perhaps I'll just draw a cation just really as a circle. <laughs> and we can kind of get the idea that whatever positive ion that might be, it's any metallic ion that's lost electrons. Those are positive cations. And let's just pick an easy example like water. Water is a dipole. Water is a polar molecule. Water has areas that are positive and negative. And if I were to draw water molecules, I would surround that positive ion by the negative region of the water. That's the negative oxygen on the water molecule that creates the negative area up on that O, oxygen. So I start to see how the oxygens align themselves from water completely surrounding the positive ion. This process has a name. It's called solvation, to solvate, not salvate, but solvate to create a solution. If we were to draw an anion, which is negative, being dissolved into a polar molecule, well, let's just draw an anion, how about as simple as a negative circle. These are non-metallic elements. Non-metals create anions. They're just gaining electrons through the process of creating a formula unit, an ionic compound. So if I think about how water would align itself now, well, it's going to be the H's that are nearby, isn't it? Because the H's have the positive region on it. So as I start to draw uh, water molecules surrounding a negative ion, The hydrogen surround a negative. What we've just shown, and again, I'm just drawing with dashed lines to show the intermolecular attractions, the ion dipole force. The charged area of an ion being attracted to a charged area of a polar molecule. Ion dipole forces. 
Let me pause here and ask for a moment of uh, just processing. I'm going to ask that you uh, turn to your neighbor and talk. Turn to somebody, even if it's nobody nearby. Please talk. What the heck did we just do? Check in with them. Make sure that they have the same understanding of each little definition. It's time to talk. <laughs> 